Presenting officer, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure uh, to set out the objectives and legislative priorities of this Scottish Government uh, for the coming year. This should be uh, taken with the uh, document, Principles and Priorities, the Government's programme for Scotland, which has been made available to every member of the Chamber. But there is a, another difference, uh, I think, from this speech compared to similar ones delivered in the past. Now, some of the reasons for that are obvious. The people of Scotland know that this is a minority government and operates in a parliament, therefore, different to any other elected in the history of this parliament. It's one created by the people in which the government can propose and lead, but can't compel or dictate. Uh, as First Minister, I respond to that democratic desire for shared political leadership, therefore, by introducing a programme which seeks to persuade, rather than one which uh, asserts the domination of one party or coalition or one world view. I hope that members will find a great deal in what is announced today, therefore, which reflects these shared values and shared objectives. Now, that was a pledge when uh, this government took office 112 days ago. In other words, that this government did not believe that every problem, however big, however small, could or indeed should be resolved through legislation. Politicians often like to believe that we exist to make law, and only through constantly changing the law we can achieve policy objectives. That view of political leadership is mistaken. Perhaps in its early days, this Parliament felt it had to legislate to be seen to justify its existence. But Scotland has moved on. And just as we have a Parliament, not an Assembly, so now we have a Government, yeah. not an Executive. <laughs> so today I ask the Chamber to support the 11 Government Bills in this year's programme. But never to confuse that legislative activity, important though it is, it shouldn't be confused with the totality of what government can achieve. In truth, I think most people already believe there's too much legislation and yearn for a more considered and restricted approach. I embrace that sense of legislative restraint. It is not the purpose of government to legislate, rather it's for government and parliament to legislate with a purpose. Presiding officer, in that context, I will doubtless be criticised by some on the basis that 11 government bills in this programme is still higher than the eight bills introduced by Donald Dewar in his speech in 1999. Others might criticise because the figure is lower than the 15 bills introduced by Jack McConnell in 2003. Such are the joys of national leadership. Yet I say to all members that each of the bills has been properly considered and deserves to be passed by this chamber. This government has adopted an approach to government based on three objectives. First, we believe that to win and retain the trust of the people requires an administration uh, willing to focus and showing competence and direction on the day-to-day -day business of government. Secondly, we believe also that the people of Scotland want a government based on principle, but able to move with mainstream opinion to build consensus in the public interest. But thirdly, we believe that government will always be about vision, restoring belief in the power of democratic elected government to affect change, something which remains one of the great challenges for any modern government, is about focusing on the possible, merely accepting than accepting the status quo. It means painting a picture of a better, more dynamic society and offering Scotland a vision of radical and inspirational choice for the future. Our national conversation seeks to do precisely that. At the end of the four-year term of this government, those are the objectives, competence, consensus and vision against which we should be judged. Uh, of course, that judgment could come earlier if the opposition parties wish to force an election. Uh, indeed, I read that an electoral test could come as early as next month. However, that is a matter for the Prime Minister and of course I wouldn't, in, I wouldn't dream of uh, treading on a, a reserved matter. <laughs> just, just for the record, however, I would welcome a Westminster election next month just as long as it's not organised by the Scotland office under electronic <laughs> voting. <laughs> uh, presiding officer, it's the very stuff of politics that parties like to have a go at each other. A vibrant democracy demands no less. But equally, I would be disappointed in the parties in this chamber if they were not able to acknowledge that some of what this government has already achieved. The first hundred days of this government have been marked by a sense of purpose. 
Specific commitments we pledged in opposition and now delivered on our way to delivery in government. Some were even things we didn't say we would definitely be able to deliver. If we take, for example, Mr. Presiding Officer, one area of Scotland dear to your heart, Ayrshire and the southwest of Scotland, important initiatives such as assisting the Duke of Rossi in the development of Dumfries House for the nation and for Ayrshire, and even more importantly yet, not just saving, but developing access to university education at the Crichton campus in Dumfries. In February of this year, David Mundell MP said it would take a miracle to save Glasgow University participation in the Crichton campus. It is now official. Miracles happen in SNP <laughs> run Scotland. It is, of course, Mr. Presiding Officer, hugely important that all of Scotland has access to high quality higher education. Just as important that all girls in Scotland have access to cervical cancer vaccination. Another announcement made beyond our 100 day programme. And looking back on these 100 days, it would be remiss not to record my profound thanks to all those throughout Scotland who united in recent months to face the twin challenges of a foot and mouth outbreak south of the border and a terrorist attack on Glasgow Airport. I know that every member in this chamber will share my view that both serious episodes were responded to in such a way that ensured the minimum of damage and disruption. Both events in their own different ways illustrate the immense value of Scottish community solidarity. Against that background, let me turn to the legislative of the programme itself. With your permission, presiding officer, I'll attempt to approach both the bills and the other government action in a thematic way. Let me turn first to the economy. Members will recall our stated ambition to create a wealthier and fairer Scotland. Members will also know that sustainable growth is our highest priority, which is why the first meeting of the Council of Economic Advisers later this month matters so much. We look to that Council for expert guidance in driving up the Scottish growth rate. All that this country can achieve depends on developing our nation as a high growth, vibrant economy. In the modern global economy, even the greatest political ambition is doomed to failure without an economy driving employment, investment, research, development and rewarding success. Our economic strategy will focus in three areas in particular. On lowering business tax and simplifying regulation, on boosting skills and on improving the focus and delivery of our enterprise network. We have already made our intentions clear on reducing business tax and other burdens. In the view of this administration, Lower business tax for small business will provide an impetus to get our local economies moving. We'll also reform the enterprise network to simplify the delivery of these services to business. And the Cabinet Secretary will make further announcements on that in early course. In addition, we are committed to assisting businesses by creating a single environment rural service for those who deal regularly with agencies such as SEPA and SNH. And in terms of the rural areas of Scotland, the coming six years will see a 1.6 billion programme of development to support business ventures and encourage business diversification. That is a strong indication of this government's commitment. But although much of economic policy does not require primary legislation, there are a number of bills which we believe can and will make a difference. Accordingly, in this parliamentary year, we will introduce our abolition of bridge tolls bill to make good our commitment to move the tolls on the Forth and Tay bridges. The Chamber is aware of the Government's view it's unacceptable and unfair to leave the two road bridges in and out of Fife as the only remaining toll bridges in Scotland. But the removal of tolls will undoubtedly be a welcome boost to the local economies in Tayside and around the Forth. And as we move forward with key infrastructure projects around Scotland, we have made rapid progress with the consultation exercise on the strategically necessary new fourth crossing. In this parliamentary year, we also introduce our Culture Scotland Bill to establish a new cultural development body, Creative Scotland, by amalgamating the Scottish Arts Council and Scottish Screen. This year, an incredible 1.7 million tickets were sold at the Edinburgh Fringe. Culture, of course, has a, a value in itself, but it's also a value in generating jobs and income for our economy. I believe that this bill will pave the way for a much stronger creative sector in Scotland that will serve our economic interests, promote the culture for decades to come, and will also be informed, of course, by the Scottish Broadcasting Commission on the vital role of broadcasting in our national 
and cultural life. Another bill which will assist individuals and companies alike is an introduction this year of the Interest Scotland Bill in order to develop fair and consistent rules for the application of interest rates to payments of debts and damages in Scotland. The Chamber will be aware this reform has already been recommended by the Scottish Law Commission. It's long overdue and it's my hope that such a measure will achieve cross-party support. Presiding officer, let me make a brief mention of future legislation in the slightly more contentious area of local income tax. In the coming parliamentary year, we'll begin consultation on our proposals to replace the unfair and discredited council tax with a fair local income tax based on the ability to pay. In the late autumn, our strategic spending review will set out our policies for the next four years in a comprehensive and detailed way. Its purpose will be to explain how we invest the resources available to the government for the remainder of the parliamentary term in order to achieve our ambitions for Scotland. Later this parliamentary year, we'll therefore introduce the annual budget bill to finance the public services that Scotland needs. Now, the predictions, Mr. Presiding Officer, from Westminster are for a tight budget round. However, the level of squeeze in the money available to Scotland from Westminster remains unclear until later next month. But members can be assured that the government will bring forward a full, transparent and costed programme to meet that budget. Yeah, yeah. At a time when the national conversation over the future of this Parliament's ability to raise and spend its own revenue based on the success of our economy is centre stage, I pause just briefly, Presiding Officer, to note the absurdity of this Parliament being responsible for spending money passed from London, but being in a position where even higher growth and prosperity in Scotland will not alter the sums available to a Scottish Government of whatever political hue to spend in the Scottish national interest. That, presiding officer, is a debate to which we shall no doubt return. A critical aspect of increasing economic growth is creating a smarter Scotland. Already in the first 100 days, members will be aware of our efforts to drive down class sizes and increase the number of teaching places, but we need to do more. That is precisely why, in this parliamentary year, we'll introduce our Graduate Endowment Abolition Bill to abolish the Graduate Endowment Fee for graduates from this year forward. This will benefit 50,000 students in Scotland who will no longer be asked to pay back-end fees after yeah. university. We do so in the certain knowledge that if we are to compete as a nation in the global economy, we need to upskill Scotland. That means more Scots in the workforce with higher vocational skills, and it means many more with graduate skills as well. If we are to turn Scotland into a powerhouse economy, we must remove, not erect, barriers to degree level education. This, after all, is the country which pioneered the principle of universal free education. I am proud to lead a government which re-establishes that principle. In the area of rural schools, it remains our position there should be a legislative presumption against closure. And after the necessary consultation, it is our intention to bring forward proposals to safeguard rural schools and the communities of which they're part. Some matters at this stage do not require legislation. For example, our commitment to an early year strategy is one which has support across the chamber. And on the much debated issue of free school meals, my government will establish a pilot of free school meals for all primary one to three children in selected local authorities. Setting off, sir, in the coming weeks, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning shall publish our skills strategy to provide a fresh agenda for skills and learning in Scotland. In the coming months, we will also be developing our plans for a science and innovation strategy, which has such a pivotal role in our future prosperity. Mr. Presiding Officer, a skilled people, an economy with a competitive edge, these are the ways to transform the economic performance of Scotland. But the link between economic well-being and health of the nation is also well established. This parliamentary year, therefore, will also focus in making progress towards making Scotland healthier. We do so both from an economic perspective, but also more fundamentally as a moral imperative for government. Turning the Scottish health record around is a long-term mission, but it's one in which this government seeks the support of all parties. During the first 100 days, we've already taken important steps towards helping people sustain and improve their health. We've made a commitment to a new 18-week guarantee covering the entire patient pathway from referral by GP to admission to hospital by the end of 2011. Moreover, we have pledged to abolish the hidden waiting lists which cause anguish and frustration to so many. 
We have established a Sutherland review to look at the future funding of free personal care. We are determined not only to enhance free personal care provision, but to secure its place at the heart of the social care agenda. Free personal care is an achievement of which this Parliament can be justifiably proud. Our priority now is to protect and enhance the delivery of that care to those in need. We we'll work with others in this chamber to improve the government's efforts to tackle the scourge of drugs which afflict so many of our communities across Scotland. And we have made it clear to NHS boards that we fully expect them to deliver the 62-day cancer target from this December 2007. Presiding officer, I know that the decision, our decision to continue accident emergency service at Ayr Monklands Hospital was fiercely contested in this chamber. But the decision we reached wasn't just popular, it was also the right thing to do. If the debate in Ayr and Monklands reinforced anything, it's surely that we must never forget, any of us, that the National Health Service is a public service. It is a service used by the public, paid for by the public. And as we look to the parliamentary year ahead, we must never forget it is the duty of health boards and of responsive government to take full account of local views and circumstances. Accordingly, we will introduce our local health care bill to give greater patient and community involvement in the delivery of local health services, introduce direct elections to national health service boards. Presiding officer, we shall also introduce a public health bill. This bill will be designed to comprehensively modernise our public health legislation, which is currently set out in a number of acts dating as far back as 1897. The purpose of that bill is to redefine and clarify the relationships between ministers, health boards and local authorities. It is specifically designed to strengthen the role of these health boards and has a range of measures including giving effect to international obligations designed to prevent the spread of disease. In terms of future legislation, it is appropriate this time to consult on how best to implement the Patient Rights Bill, a draft measure which includes the right to an individual waiting time guarantee. And away from primary legislation, but also in this parliamentary year, we will develop a comprehensive health strategy to equip the health services for the challenge of the future. In that strategy, we will detail our plans for providing better access to GP appointments, introducing health checks in schools in disadvantaged areas, and action taken to raise the age of buying tobacco from 16 to 18. We will proceed on the basis that what Scotland needs is flexible access to, to care and move away from the rigidities of the traditional system. Presiding officer, in my view, public health is the biggest social challenge facing this parliament and this country. We will require a concerted and united cross-party effort to make progress but let me be clear today about why that challenge has to be met head on. It is unacceptable that eight out of the 10 areas in the UK with the lowest life expectancy are in the city of Glasgow. It is surely a matter of national scandal that life expectancy in war-torn Iraq remains higher than in some of the areas of our largest city of Scotland. And which member in this chamber is not shamed by reports such as that recently from Bernardo's, highlighting that despite all the efforts of previous governments, one in ten Scottish children are living in severe poverty. Another one in five in houses with an income of less than £10,000 and one in three don't have access to an NHS dentist. Those figures challenge our claims to be a caring, compassionate and cohesive society. They should compel this Parliament to devise new and innovative ways to reach those in society successive governments have left behind. Our united belief, Mr Presiding Officer, in social justice demands nothing less. Presiding officer, it is my hope that this chamber will unite behind another bill, the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games Bill. I know that Glasgow 2014 has support across the chamber, indeed across the country. And if we're successful, the legislation will help ensure that we host the games that all of Scotland and indeed all of the Commonwealth can be proud. The games represent, if we're successful, a massive opportunity to promote Scotland on the world stage as well as developing the facilities and providing the inspiration to get more young Scots physically active. Presiding officer, in relation to Scotland's international profile, let me be also clear that we shall positively and fully engage in crucial debates about the future of the European Union. This government, indeed this parliament, has an obligation to express the views of the Scottish people on all matters which have concerned them. We were right to do so in relation to the invasion of Iraq, and we are right to do so now and the future. 
We intend to reach out to Scots around the globe and engage with the diaspora in a more substantial and meaningful way. The broadening and deepening of these relationships is critical to our international profile and economic success, just as developing our international aid effort is a moral imperative for this Parliament. Returning to domestic matters, it's the stated intention of this Government to have a safer and a stronger Scotland. We have already made significant progress in negotiations with Westminster on the transfer of responsibilities for firearms to this Parliament. We will press ahead for agreement with a view into introducing secondary legislation later in the parliamentary year to protect Scots from the dangers of air guns. And of course, only a fortnight ago, we announced plans for a new prison in the northeast of Scotland. After years of indecision, we have taken a positive decision to replace the Victorian facilities in Aberdeen and Peterhead with a brand new state-of-the-art prison in the northeast. Moreover, this new prison, like the replacement prison now at Bishop Briggs, will be a prison run in the public sector for the public good and not for private profit. <laughs> this represents a substantial shift in direction from that of the previous administration, and I was delighted to see the initiative received such a broad welcome. Equally, we know that a visible police presence on the streets is the best means we have of reassuring, community, reassuring communities throughout Scotland. High visibility police presence deters primal, criminals. That is why we shall set out later this year a proposal for working with the police and others to increase capacity by the equivalent of 1,000 officers and seek to place them in our communities. We shall introduce our Judiciary Scotland Bill to legally establish a Judicial Appointments Board and modernise the organisation and leadership of the judiciary. That means putting the court system under the direction of the Lord President, enshrining the independence of the judiciary. In the area of criminal law, we'll introduce a Rape and Sexual Offences Bill to reform the law on rape and sexual offences in the light of the Scottish Law Commission's review. Presenting officer, I doubt there's a member in this chamber who doesn't realise the need for action in this area. Members will know that one of the first actions of this government was to make clear our opposition to new nuclear power stations being built in Scotland. We've made it central to our Greener Scotland programme. Those who doubt the potential of these initiatives should note that this Friday, Green Energy Day, we shall mark the fact that the installed capacity of the range of renewables in Scotland has now overtaken the installed capacity of nuclear power. And as we make the contribution in terms of electricity generation, we'll introduce consultation in our coming climate change bill so that we can reflect our obligations to planetary security. To protect people from the implications of, of climate change, we'll introduce this session our flooding preventions bill to modernise our defences against the effects of climate change. Presiding officer, I've set out the government's immediate plans for the coming year and giving some indication of further action to follow in subsequent years. Let me say to Jamie McGregor and Ken McIntosh that we'll be discussing with them, because I realise and respect the role and rights of backbenchers, how to carry forward their particular initiatives and legislation in this session into law. In conclusion, Mr. Presiding Officer, demonstrating competence in government means introducing policy initiatives and legislation designed to deliver change for the better in Scotland. But looking at government just in the context of annual programmes is artificial. The big challenges, kick-starting the economy, transforming public health, are about the long term. That is why, Mr. Presiding Officer, we launched the national conversation in Scotland's future. It's about creating a vibrant economy, the healthy society, the socially environmental just society in which all of us, all of us believe. We have a certain vision. Others take a different view. But as today our programme makes very clear, we are ready, willing and able to work in the current devolved parliament to improve the lives of every person in this country. Vitally, we must equip this parliament with the tools to make the progress that we all aspire to happen. Years of underperformance tells us that the status quo is not capable of delivering the step change in Scottish life we all want to see. That much, I think, is accepted to some extent, at least, by every member now <coughs> in this chamber. 
Accordingly, presiding officer, in commending to this Parliament our programme for government, I ask that we remain focused not just on this year or next year, but on the country we can be, the country we should be, the country we must be. And that is why this is not just a legislative programme, nor even just a government programme. It is a programme for Scotland.